special edition of the Military Wire Vision 2020 Speaker Series with Mike Schindler. I am Mike Schindler, and this is the series where we interview some of America's most elite men and women who have served this country. We share their stories of overcoming in hopes that you, our viewer, and our listener will gain an aha moment that you can apply to your life. So I'm excited about this episode. This episode is actually sponsored by Bonefrog Cellars which is a premier uh, in sacred wine by Navy SEAL Tim Cruikshank and his team. And proceeds from that wine actually go to the Navy SEAL Foundation, where it helps the families of those of fallen SEALs. So this episode I'm pretty excited about, guys. This is how the elite are selling the American dream for a profit. And who are they selling it to? Is it China? We can't seem to go a day without hearing about China or Russia. And is it in fact China who is buying the American dream? And what does this mean to everyday Americans who are just trying to get by? Well, to help me unpack this subject, is retired Brigadier General Robert Spaulding. He is a former China strategist for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Joint Staff at the Pentagon, as well as a senior defense official and defense attache to China. He earned his doctorate in economics and mathematics from the University of Missouri, and he is fluent in Mandarin. General, welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you're here. I just want to say that there was only one college class that I dropped, and that was Mandarin. So uh, <laughs> the fact that you're fluent in it uh, is very impressive. Um, so I'm excited to unpack this. Before we dive into this topic of whether the elites are selling us out or not, I want to first of all thank you for your service in uniform to this country for over 25 years. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think many of our youth are searching for purpose, for mission and purpose. And I think the military offers a great uh, opportunity to find just that. So before we get started in the topics, tell us why you chose to raise your right hand. <laughs> well, you know, I, uh, I, have a, um, I had a bachelor's degree in agricultural business um, and went to Fresno State University. And uh, during my senior year of college, I saw this movie called Top Gun. Oh. And uh, my view of the military before that was, um, let's say, not, you know, not very well informed. Um, now, I'm not saying that Top Gun uh, made it uh, more informed, you know, from a realistic <laughs> perspective. But what it did do is it make it made it more exciting, yes. and uh, so I joined, and uh, you know, really only intended to do one uh, one assignment, and you know, just uh, one opportunity led to another, and probably the biggest thing was you know having the ability to go to China and live there as a student. Wow, that's impressive. Well, you you and I share uh, the same motivation for getting into the military. Uh, it was Top Gun. I remember sitting in that movie theater, and and I raced right down to the Navy recruiter. And, and uh, I did the very same. Uh, did not have the same results as Top Gun, but uh, still was one of the best experiences. So um, I love that. So let's dive right into this topic because this is pretty fascinating. I think, you know, there's a lot that's going on in the news right now about this. Uh, we, you know, hear our president talk a lot about China right now. Um, I think some of the media say he's just flat out wrong about China. Uh, I think some are certainly siding with him. You've got a new book that's coming out called Stealth, uh, Stealth War, How China Took Over While America's Elite Slept. And you assert that this selling off has been going on for decades, even prior to President Trump. Um, when did this start? I mean, have we been sleeping at the wheel for a long period of time? Well, I mean, it really it has gone on for a long time, but it really accelerated uh, after China joined the WTO. Um, before that, you know, their economy was less than a trillion dollars of GDP. Um, fast forward to today, they're over, you know, almost 14, 15 trillion dollars of GDP. Uh, so they grew tremendously uh, in the intervening years. And at the same time, the, the industrial capacity of the United States has been decimated. So, hmm. So talk to me a little bit about that. When, uh, when we talk about decimation, is that one of the reasons why the president is trying to get industry back over here, manufacturing back over here? Did we just offload all that and just China took over? Yeah, you know, and, and there's a number of labor studies. Uh, you know, the, the, the general theme was that, you know, the United States will move up the value chain and will be more of uh, mm -hmm. intellectual property uh, 
uh, type of economy, more of an information or knowledge economy, if you will. Uh, and then we'll offload all this, you know, dirty manufacturing to China. Um, I think the anticipation was in doing so that as China, um, you know, grew economically, that they would liberalize politically. And then, you know, our differences with regard to how we see the world in terms of, you know, geopolitics and, uh, and national security would more align. And, and clearly, um, as you can see, that it hasn't been the case. And so one of the things that we forgot about is a terrible importance that we place on, you know, where things are manufactured, particularly uh, if they're manufactured in a place that could potentially be a future um, strategic competitor, which is essentially what China has become. So, you know, things like the, you know, um, as we talk about in the book, uh, the propellant for, for Hellfire missiles or the, um, the, the key components within night vision goggles or what have you, depending on, you know, I mean, there are so many things that are within our industrial, military industrial supply chain that are now almost entirely sourced or in some cases entirely sourced by China. Well, and, that put, and I would guess that that puts us at great risk uh, if there were to ever become a battle between the two nations, not, not just economically, correct? Absolutely. But, you know, in another sense, it also has led to um, this ability by the Chinese, um, you know, this integration, this globalization integration and the, and the um, build out of the internet has led to this ability by the Chinese Communist Party to not only have we offshored our industrial base, but they have purchased within our corporate sector and Wall Street and political institution, academic institutions that enable them to influence our citizens. Uh, as I talk about in the book, Marriott Corporation, uh, there was a, a gentleman named Roy Jones who liked to tweet about Tibet working for Marriott and Chinese Communist Party called up Marriott and said, hey, apologize and firing them. And they did. We saw this last year with the NBA and um, Daryl Morey, the general manager of the Houston Rockets, almost fired for um, supporting the freedom fighters in Hong Kong. So this is a problem that where it's extended beyond just, you know, an impact to our industrial base, it's begun to uh, impact our society and our political system as well. Yeah, this is pretty interesting because you, you assert that our universities are kind of this strategic zone where the communist narrative is making headway. Uh, it's being kind of, uh, I don't want to say people are being educated, they're more or less being indoctrinated that this might be a true philosophy for people to adopt, to adopt certainly our youth. So, so walk me through this a little bit. Is there evidence to support this? How are you making this assertion and what are you seeing to go ahead and, and, and really say that this yes is in fact is happening? Well, other than, the, um, other than the corporate influence that I just talked about, of course, these Confucius Institutes, which are run by the propaganda arm of the Chinese Communist Party, are essentially you know, there to uh, control the narrative with regard to China and the Chinese people that's taught on American campuses. That also applies to Tibet, you know, Taiwan, Hong Kong, or any other issue that the Chinese Communist Party feels it's, um, that's important. You know, this at the, is at the same time coupled with uh, a process that started in the late 40s, continued in the 60s and 70s, you know, in China, it was the Cultural Revolution. In the rest of the free world, it was really the rise of this postmodernist theory where, um, you know, you have today the challenging of, you know, knowledge. You know, how do we, how do, how do we uh, come to uh, think and know the information that we know? And in fact, that, you know, there's, there's uh, an element of that theory, postmodernist theory, that asserts that you know science really isn't relevant. In fact, in many cases, science may um, be part of the the overall arching power structure. In a lot of ways, this aligns very well with the Chinese Communist Party's narrative, which is the only source of truth is the Chinese Communist Party. Any other source of truth uh, is invalid. In fact, the highest power in China is not a god, it's not a, uh, it's not a government, it's not a system, it is the party itself. And so, you know, that, that really aligns well with how universities are beginning to, 
you know, institutionalize this idea of postmodernist theory, which is really about challenging where truth come from. And when you have that, when you have that kind of environment and this global connectivity, and what the Chinese have done is taken the, the power of the internet and, and what Silicon Valley has built and it's in the, in the large tech companies with regard to using data uh, uh, of the individual to create algorithms that influence that individual, that pervasive, uh, pervasive ability that we thought would, would be able to spread d democratic principles and values abroad has actually been reversed. And now authoritarian systems like China are beginning to promote these principles in our own society. And that is you know, their own narrative of what truth is. So where did we slip up? I mean, this is interesting to me because, you know, one of the conversations we had with Lieutenant General Boykin, he, you know, he said a lot of this dates back to the, you know, the naked communists. You know, this has been going on since the 40s, similar to what you're saying, where this whole push to go ahead and institute this and kind of break down the family and, and kind of spread a different truth throughout. Where did we slip up when you look at it, even from an academic or even a practical standpoint, how do we let go of the principles that keep America strong, that keep America true, that identify our truth? How did this happen? Well, it's, it's very, in a, in a way, it's very much similar to the French uh, prior to World War II and the Maginot Line. We've created this view of the world that, you know, with this very powerful military, the United States is essentially secure. You know, we've had this notion of two big oceans, two friendly borders, and this ability to extend uh, American power around the world that it would ensure that danger was taken care of before it ever got to American shores. You know, 9-11 proved the falsity of that, but it didn't prove it in a way that was entirely existential, more so that, you know, it could it, certainly harm could come to the American people. I think the difference is, is that you know, in, in developing global connectivity in the internet in today's mobile, you know, 4G world, this ability to collect data on individuals and then monetize that data uh, as evidenced by companies like Facebook, Amazon, and Google are really what we're talking about. This ability to take data and use it in ways that, um, you know, before the, the invention of these algorithms and the systems, of e-commerce and, and the information economy that we couldn't you know, leverage. And so in many ways, like the nuclear weapon was a trans, uh, transformational weapon in terms of war, uh, in the case of the internet and certainly artificial intelligence, machine learning and big data analysis, that has created an entirely new way of waging war. And that's really about controlling the way people think. And so the Chinese Communist Party having that in their in their history in terms of the way they look about warfare and and when i when i say that it's if you look at the western way of war and you go back to clausewitz where he mm. says that military or, or that war is a is politics by other means in other words you um you wage war to uh, generate a political outcome in your adversary to get them to coerce them to otherwise motivate them to accept your interests. And, and from the Chinese Communist Party perspective, it's completely the opposite. Rather than war is politics by other means, politics is war by other means. In other words, the political war is the primary war. And, and really um, fighting you know, in the military sense is, is very risky for a nation state. And therefore, you should seek to achieve your ends without having re to re resort to conflict. Now, it just so turns out that globalization and the internet is a perfect way to spread this version of warfare because it's all about dominating the information space. It's about dominating the narrative. Now, this is exactly how the Chinese Communist Party defeated the Nationalist Party, a much more uh, economically uh, resourced. They had Western equipment and Western training, much more militarily powerful foe. But what they did was erode the confidence of the population in the Nationalist Party and eventually were able to defeat them uh, and, and, and send them to Taiwan. Now, that was confined geographically because of the tools that they had at their disposal. But when you, when you give them and you integrate them into the globalized world and you give them access to the internet 
now they can use those same tools that we have used to make Facebook, Amazon, and Google, you know, an, an element of 25% of the S&P 500 that the FANGs represent, hmm. and then take that power and then use it to not only gain economic power, not only to influence people to buy things, but also to influence them on their social and political beliefs as well. That's the, that's the key um, you know, insight that the Chinese Communist Party uh, understood, that not only could these systems and this connectivity be used for economic dominance, it could be used for social and political dominance. And so you have uh, like Kai-Fu Lee, the artificial intelligence uh, thought leader for China saying that, you know, the Chinese approach or strategy is to become the Saudi Arabia of data because it is data on the individual that allows them to, you know, both use these algorithms and artificial intelligence to achieve a certain outcome. So, okay, so if I, if I were to break this down, I would say, number one, you're proposing that we're already at war, but it's a it's certainly, it's an intelligence war. I mean, it, it'll be a war of artificial intelligence. It'll be a, a war of controlling the dialogue, the narrative and the mind. Um, not only is it for profit, but it's really for a way of thinking. As, am, I, am I restating that correctly? Right, so if you think about the problem of the Chinese Communist Party, their challenge is to, you know, in building the great firewalls to ensure that their people aren't aware of other political systems, other social mm -hmm. systems, that free speech and freedom of religion are just taken as things that actually don't exist, nor should they exist, or freedom from oppression. And in, in reality, the legitimacy, the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party comes from providing jobs to the Chinese people. And then nothing else is questioned in terms of their rights or privileges. Now, in order to maintain this facade in a globalized internet connected world, they need to make sure that those principles that are resident in the United States and in Europe and other free states in Asia and around the world don't somehow come into contact or gain purchase in China. And so they've created an apparatus to prevent this, one of which, and I don't, I don't think people really understand this. So in behind the Great Firewall, the Chinese Communist Party blocks any other social media um, platforms and any other e-commerce platforms that they that they find that they deem unsuitable. At the same time, they have their own, like WeChat. So WeChat is a platform that has over a billion users and allows you to pay for things, do your banking, do your travel, and also do social media posts all in the same platform. So 90% of the people never, never leave WeChat mm -hmm. as their platform of use because there's so many things that you can use it for. Well, when they leave China, when they physically get on an airplane and fly to the United States, now they have access to Twitter, they have access to Facebook, but they don't use them. They stay on WeChat. So in essence, what they've created is by getting, getting them hooked on these platforms in China before they leave, it ensures that the Chinese Communist Party can monitor them and control them once they leave the Great Firewall. So it becomes a very powerful way of wedding the Chinese people to their own version of the Facebook, Amazon, Google world. So, you know, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, or these major, major tech companies in China that have dominated the Chinese language speaking world. And then, you know, seek to over time through um, dominance of the next, uh, the platform of the future, not the smartphone, but the smart city. What we're talking about here is 5G to be able to dominate people's, you know, essentially buy into that uh, platform and then eventually dominate the Facebook, Amazon, and Googles of the future. So rather than, you know, this being a Huawei problem as has been portrayed, it's a problem of the, of the large tech companies in China that are vying for economic dominance around the globe so that they can use that control over data to also influence population. So if the United States... Um, population over time begins to reject the um, the tenets of our founding principles like freedom of speech and freedom of religion, which you notice that is beginning to happen as we speak, yeah. then essentially the Chinese Communist Party is successful in, in preserving its control over the narrative amongst Chinese language speakers. And so 
this is how, this is why it's so important, important for them to promote these, these ideas, these concepts abroad and have access and control over the data that's coming out of these, um, out of these systems. Because if they have your data, they understand who you are and they can begin to incentivize you in ways that essentially create in your own mind that you're, you're doing something on your own behalf but in reality, it's along a path that's been predetermined for you. And, and I know this is hard for people to see, hmm. but, um, you know, it is part of the social media experience. And, if, and you know, we, if we go back to the 2016 elections, there were numerous people that were uh, physically protesting in the street on behalf of um, the Russians. It's a fact. And because they hmm. used AI bots to essentially encourage them to do that. Now, the, the, the thing that probably most people don't know is the same thing is going on uh, in, during the coronavirus and in the, in the riots and looting in the aftermath thereof, because those same bots, now not just coming from Russia, but also coming from China, are promoting more and more, they're inciting more emotion. And, and, the, and the idea here is really to, to increase the turnout for these protests. So, it, 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 boy, there's so much that you just said in all of this that I really wanna unpack, and I just wanna be careful how I unpack this, but this is interesting to me in that it, part of my brain is going to, this can't just be all about profit and dominance, and how can we possibly ever even go there in the United States. And yet you said, you know, we're starting to see this even with the coronavirus or even the cancel culture for that matter. Like if you think differently than what the, the you know, the normalized dialogue is, that you're kind of put on the sideline, uh, even this cashless society piece that people are starting to push and promote and how people can be controlled by this. But you're talking about not only profits, but thought, but you're also talking about, but I guess my question is to what end though, you know, in military strategy, we have an end in mind is the end in mind with this whole idea. Is it just absolute pure dominance and way of thinking like a bunch of robots running around? I mean, I, I don't want to discredit the Chinese and say that they're not, they're not creative, but if there's dominance like this, to what end that, that goes against the grain of the American spirit. And how could we ever let that go? Well, because um, what's, what's been happening alongside of the control that the Chinese Communist Party has established over China is this general, particularly amongst um, academia in the United States and other Western countries, this general rejection of what you would call classic liberal ideas. And that is the, the whole scientific method, you know, the, 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 how do you attain knowledge? What, you know, so... There is, uh, in, again, I go back to this idea of postmodern uh, theory, which says that, you know, all knowledge, even in, from the period of the Enlightenment, when, you know, there was a, there was a promotion of, uh, of liberal thought, of, uh, of individuality, of scientific exploration, and, you know, a, a general determination to um, determine universal truths there's a general rejection of that in academia. And if you think about it, it plays quite well to what the Chinese Communist Party says, because that's exactly what they want to do is control the narrative. So mm -hmm. if the narrative is only um, about power structures and, um, and then there, that therefore that you can reject anything that even the discussion of the narrative, if you can basically say in, in discussing the narrative, you are essentially trying to undermine the power structure. Now you're basically playing into the world that the Chinese Communist Party seeks to dominate. So what's their end goal? Their end goal is dominance for China, but their real end goal is to maintain control over China. So the Chinese people are subjects of the Chinese Communist Party who reign as a sovereign in China. They wanna keep that control primarily for their own benefit because they essentially skim off the top and make and, and enrich themselves. I'm, here I'm talking about the, the party leadership, but they want to they want to maintain that and, and perpetuate that power structure. And globalization and the internet gives them the capacity to do so because it enables them from behind that bastion of the Great Firewall. They can essentially begin to influence 
the political and social leanings, particularly as the academic uh, institutions of the West are already inclined to question the very source of knowledge in the West, right? It, is, is the scientific method a legitimate form of providing truth or rather um, is that just a, a, a method that promotes the current power structure when you, when you qu begin to question how you arrive at the truth, then you're basically creating the type of environment, environment that is very, very um, conducive to allowing the Chinese Communist Party con to control the narrative. And that, that I think, is, is a great challenge of our society. You know, we, we, we have just arrived at a space and time where both the technology, um, the globalized uh, economy, and this, this you know, world without borders has enabled authoritarianism, in this case, to really run rampant in democracies. And we created defenses that were more physical in nature, you know, armies and air forces yeah. and space forces now, and the, the Navy and the Marines, that would, because we anticipated an invasion and a physical coercion of the populace, we didn't anticipate a, a psychological and ideological, a social and a political dominance, you know, that, that was devoid of any requirement for open warfare. So how do we win this then? I mean, if, if, if it truly is, you know, if it truly is, you know, this is a cyber war, essentially what you're describing. I mean, this is a thought war. People led, you know, trying to change the way that we think, how we do things here in, in the United States. H how do we win it? How does the everyday person get up in the morning and say, okay, in general, I get it, but what can I do? So how do we win it? Well, I mean, I think that's a, the, the first part of that is, is to educate yourself, to know that it is a possibility that you, there are ha these outside influences that are trying to change the character of our society. But more importantly, on a national level, we need a secure encrypted internet for the American people. Now that's what we put into the national security strategy. It's on page 19. It says, we're gonna build a nationwide secure 5G network. But because the military and our national security professionals are so focused on the classic ways of war, they didn't understand what those words meant. And more importantly, the corporate sector in the United States wanted to perpetuate their own control of the infrastructure that, that, run, that carries the data upon which you know, our economy relies. And so it is to really look at uh, the internet and information and data, just like the Chinese and the Russians did, that they are means of a warfare, particularly psychological and ideological warfare, and that we need to protect our population from that. So that means that the government needs to take a much more concerted effort to protect data and to protect our citizens from, from outside influence. That's, that's it in a nutshell. So rather than creating the space force, what we should have been thinking about is how do we protect our citizens for influ from influence? How do we protect our own data in a way that um, quite frankly, we just don't do today? Yeah, well, it, it, I think it's confusing for the everyday person that's showing up and they, you know, they turn on the TV, they see this going on, they don't know who to trust, who to listen to anymore, right? So what is the one thing that you would say to your neighbor that like, hey, I'm confused, I don't know what to do if we're really at war psychological and ideological, what can I do? So what is the one thing that the, the American people can do to at least start to combat this? Well, so what I've, what I've um, looked at, you know, I think this election here in 2020 is absolutely critical. I think we need to understand the world that we're in and we need to, um, you know, promote policies that actually get to this. And so, you know, I'm encouraging people to, to ask their, you know, per, um, prospective congressmen, per, prospective senators, you know, look at the presidential election, look at all of them and say, you know, what's your view of the future going forward? What's the role of the government in terms of protecting us in these ways? And what are the policies that are going to promote the independence and sovereignty of the nation? And uh, I've laid those out uh, in uh, something I call People's War 2020. And it's really three parts, protect, um, rebuild, and inspire. And protect, it's really about decoupling from, you know, economically, financially, politically, socially from the Chinese Communist Party. 
and building the kind of uh, secure internet that I'm talking about. Rebuilding is about taking what has been going to China, you know, our bounty as a free society, and that's technology, talent, capital, and, um, and, tech, and innovation, and reinvesting that in our own country, and then sharing that bounty with those developing countries that today, you know, um, don't have civil uh, institutions and helping like we did during the Cold War, you know, things like the Marshall Plan, things like Japan and Korea, how we helped democracies develop, begin to spread democracy through economic development in a much more strategically focused way. This is using USAID and Export Import Bank and and Developmental Finance Corporation and, and Trade Development Agency and the Millennium uh, Challenge Corporation, all of these things are great, but they're not strategically focused or aligned with promoting U.S. national interests. And so if you do this as protect, rebuild, and inspire, then you're going to begin to create space for democracies to thrive internationally again. And anytime that you have a, 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 an international uh, system where democracy is, is thriving, it, it's a safer space for American democracy to flourish. And so um, it is very important that we understand what we did during the Cold War, what made us so successful, and kind of go back to some of those principles. Geez, I, well, it sounds like this election is pretty important. I think, you know, most people are being encouraged to vote. And I, it's certainly, I'm not going to put you on the spot and say who to vote for by any, uh, by any means. But I think, you know, people do need to do the research. And uh, I, I appreciate you saying that. I mean, because people are overwhelmed. They just, I think they're looking for answers. They want to know what to do. I know the people on both sides are trying to figure out what do we do next. I think uh, even... If we were to look at the cultural wars that are going on, and certainly the ideological wars, even neighbors are against neighbors, for that matter. There's not a whole lot of conversation and dialogue that's going on, which is unfortunate. Um, stealth war, I, I'm excited about what you put in that. It, how, what do you hope the reader gets from stealth war? Well, just understanding that, you know, our republic is challenged right now. And... Um, and to understand the world that we live in as it is, not as we would hope it to be. It's a different world than um, 20 years ago. It's a world that um, really is more aligned to promoting authoritarianism than it ever has been. Uh, the power of democracies, really the, the, the ability to create wealth and the real ability to innovate, that has you know, essentially been raided uh, mm -hmm. voluntarily ceded to the Chinese Communist Party. And, uh, and we need to take it back and we need to invest in our own, our own system. I think the thing that, that may uh, end up saving our republic is just the fact that, you know, when our founding fathers put in the system, it was, it was a system where if the American people, even if they didn't know it was wrong, but they could vote, they could, they could institute a change. And so I think it's really about using the vote to implement change in Washington, D.C. and a recognition of the challenges that we face. You know, you mentioned, uh, you know, neighbor against neighbor. You know, as I was thinking about this and, and trying to understand how we protect ourselves, you know, I was brought to the Second Amendment. Now, the Second Amendment, the purpose of the Second Amendment is to prevent an oppressive government from, uh, you know, to, to give the citizenry the ability, the means to, to fight back against an oppressive government. That's why the founding fathers had the, the second amendment in there. Well, you know, it turns out that in this world, in, in the 21st century, uh, you may not know that you're being oppressed. You may not even know who your oppressor is because that's the nature of these information system to begin to influence you in ways that you are not, you do not perceive. In that world, then the, the second amendment, the gun becomes irrelevant because you're not, you, you may just as likely shoot your neighbor because you've been convinced that the neighbor is the enemy. When in reality, this is in the entire goal of you know, the, a regime like the Chinese Communist Party is to induce um, division within democratic societies so that then they begin to um, essentially move away from democratic principles. That's the goal is to get us to freely of our own, you know, uh, free will to, re you know, reject democratic principles and values and adopt a, an authoritarian system because we think that's what's going to make us safe. And so as long as we can know that and use the vote 
to, to really put in those lawmakers that understand the world. And you can, you can hear them talk about it today. No. Um, Tim Scott, you know, um, from uh, Holly, from Missouri, you know, McSally from Arizona, these senators and, and Congressman Nunes from, uh, from California, you know, and it's on there. It is also on the Democratic side, although, but I will say less so, but our understanding of the world and the challenge we face and, and then just to take that, what you know, and begin to challenge these people that are running for office and make sure that your vote counts. If your vote, if you think about it and you understand the challenges that we face, then, and you can question these people because they're all, they're all providing the platform to, to ask them, you know, what, what should I support or what should my platform be? Use that vote to begin to push them in ways to get them to accept that, hey, it's not F-35s that are going to keep us safe. It's actually understand the information environment and the fact that these authoritarian systems and, and regimes seek to undermine our democratic principles that's most, uh, that creates most of the risk for our, our, the, the future of our republic. Yeah, that's so powerful. You know, I, I think I was sharing with the, the team, I said, you know, I, I, I get excited about people that, who run for office that say, here's the five reasons why you should vote for me. And here's the five reasons why you probably shouldn't, right? I mean, if, if people could just clearly spell it out that much, but as a voter, to be able to ask somebody who is running for office, tell me the five reasons why I should, and whether that aligns with the American values that I support and believe in, um, I think that's so important, and, and I thank you for that. So where can people get Stealth War? Can they get it on Amazon, bookstores worldwide, et cetera? Is that correct? All of those. They can go to my website, generalspalding.com, and get the first chapter free. Of course, if they, uh, in doing that, I'm going to send them a copy of People's War 2020 so they can look at some of the policy prescriptions, like permanent tariffs on China and you know, shifting defense spending to, for manufacturing and infrastructure in the U.S., these types of things, how, how they can, and then they can use those policy prescriptions to pressure their representatives or senators or presidential candidate, whoever, to say, hey, do you, do you favor some of these policies? And I'll tell you, the ones that don't favor the policies that I, that I talk about are those elites that I'm talking about in the book, mm -hmm. those ones that have been very wealthy and, and uh, because the Chinese Communist Party has incentivized them to want to continue this relationship with China. Wow. So generalspalding.com, correct? Correct. Yeah, that's perfect. So to our listeners, to our audience that uh, is watching and listening on the podcast, be sure that you visit generalspalding.com, get a copy of the book, get a copy of the People's War 2020 as well. I think this is very insightful. General, this has been extremely enlightening. I know for me as well, I think there's more things that I need to pay attention to as well. And for those who are ready to answer the call, we say this often, do the work and get ready to discover what your next per mission and purpose is. If it is, in fact, even maybe aligning with General Spalding and the efforts that he's doing to go ahead and win back America, be sure you visit us at Operation Military Family and check out our transition training too. But be sure to pick up a copy of Stealth War. General, I want to thank you for being on this show. This has been enlightening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And to our listeners, again, please be sure to visit generalspalding.com. And for the rest of you, be sure you check us out at Operation Military Family. Thanks so much, General. Thank you.